Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come, come back, Mother? What's the secret? The dead come Christmas Eve on a Haunted Hulk by Frank Cowper. I shall never forget that night as long as I live. It was during the Christmas vacation of 1877. I was staying with an old college friend who had lately been appointed the curate of a country parish and had asked me to come and cheer him up since he could not get away at that time. As we drove along the straight country lane from the little wayside station, it forcibly struck me that life in such a place must be dreary indeed. I have always been much influenced by local colour Above all things, I am depressed by a dead level, and here was monotony with a vengeance. On each side of the low hedges, lichen-covered and wind-cropped, stretched bare fields, the absolute level of the horizon being only broken at intervals by some mournful tree that pointed like a decrepit finger-post towards the east, for all its western growth was nipped and blasted by the roaring southwest winds. An occasional black spot dotted against the grey distance, marked a hayrick or labourer's cottage, while some two miles ahead of us the stunted spire of my friend's church stood out against the wintry sky, amid the withered branches of a few ragged trees. On our right hand stretched dreary wastes of mud, interspersed here and there with firmer patches of land, but desolate and forlorn, cut off from all communication with the mainland by acres of mud and thin streaks of brown water. A few seabirds were piping over the waste, and this was the only sound, except the grit of our own wheels and the steady step of the horse, which broke the silence. Not lively, is it, said Jones, and I couldn't say it was. As we drove up street, as the inhabitants fondly call the small array of low houses which bordered the high road, I noticed the lacklustre expression of the few children and untidy women who were loitering about the doors of their houses. There was an old tumble-down inn with a dilapidated signboard, scarcely held up by its rickety ironwork. A daub of yellow and red paint with a dingy streak of blue was supposed to represent the Duke's head, although what exalted member of the aristocracy was thus distinguished, it would be hard to say. Jones inclined to think it was the Duke of Wellington, but I upheld the theory that it was the Duke of Marlborough, chiefly basing my arguments on the fact that no artist who desired to convey a striking likeness would fail to show the great Duke in profile, whereas this personage was evidently depicted full face and wearing a three-cornered hat. At the end of the village was the church, standing in an untidy churchyard, and opposite it was a neat little house, quite new, and of that utilitarian order of architecture which will stamp the Victorian age as one of the least imaginative of eras. Two windows flanked the front door, and three narrow windows looked out overhead from under a slate roof, variety and distinction being given to the façade by the brilliant blending of the yellow bricks with red, so bright as to suggest the idea of their having been painted. A scrupulously clean stone at the front door, together with the bright green of the little palings and woodwork, told me what sort of landlady to expect, and I was not disappointed. A kindly featured woman, thin, cheery and active, received us, speaking in that encouraging tone of half-compassionate, half-proprietary patronage, which I have observed so many women adopt towards lone beings of the opposite sex. You'll find it precious dull, old man, said Jones, as we were eating our frugal dinner. There's nothing for you to do unless you care to try a shot at the duck over the mud flats. I shall be busy on and off nearly all tomorrow. As we talked, I could not help admiring the cheerful pluck with which Jones endured the terrible monotony of his life in this dreary place. His rector was said to be delicate, and in order to prolong a life which no doubt he considered valuable to the church, he lived with his family either at Torquay or Cannes, in elegant idleness, quite unable to do any duty, but fully equal to enjoying the pleasant society of those charming places, and quite satisfied that he had done his duty when he sacrificed a tenth of his income to provide for the spiritual needs of his parish. There was no squire in the place, no gentlefolk, as the rustics called them, lived nearer than five miles, and there was not a single being of his own class with whom poor Jones could associate, and yet he made no complaint. 
the nearest approach to one being the remark that the worst of it was, it was so difficult, if not impossible, to be really understood. The poor being so suspicious and ignorant, they look at everything from such a low standpoint. Enthusiasm and freshness sink so easily into formalism and listlessness. The next day, finding that I really could be of no use and feeling awkward and bored, as a man always is when another is actively doing his duty, I went off to the marshes to see if I could get any sport. I took some sandwiches and a flask with me, not intending to return until dinner. After wandering about for some time, crossing dyke after dyke by treacherous rails, more or less rotten, I found myself on the edge of a wide mere. I could see some duck out in the middle, and standing far out in the shallow water was a heron. They were all out of shot, and I saw I should do no good without the duck punt. I sat down on an old pile left on the top of the sea wall, which had been lately repaired. The duck looked very tempting, but I doubted if I should do much good in broad daylight, even if I had a duck punt without a duck gun. After sitting disconsolately for some time, I got up and wandered on. The dreariness of the scene was most depressing. Everything was brown and grey. Nothing broke the monotony of the wide-stretching mere. The whole scene gave me the impression of a straight line of interminable length, with a speck in the centre of it. That speck was myself. At last, as I turned an angle in the seawall, I saw something lying above high water mark, which looked like a boat. Rejoiced to see any signs of humanity, I quickened my pace. It was a boat, and better still, a duck punt. As I came nearer, I could see that she was old and very likely leaky, but here was a prospect of adventure, and I wasn't going to be readily daunted. On examination, the old craft seemed more watertight than I had expected. At least she held water very well, and if she kept it in, she must equally well keep it out. I turned her over to run the water out, and then, dragging the crazy old boat over the line of seaweed, launched her. But now a real difficulty met me. The paddles were nowhere to be seen. They had doubtless been taken away by the owner, and it would be little use searching for them. But a stout stick would do to punt her over the shallow water, and after some little search I found an old stake, which would answer well. This was real luck. I had now some hope of bagging a few duck. At any rate, I was afloat and could explore the little islets, which barely rose above the brown water. I might at least find some rabbits on them. I cautiously pulled myself towards the black dots, but before I came within range, up rose first one, then another, and another like a string of beads, and the whole flight went, with outstretched necks and rapidly beating wings away to my right, and seemed to pitch again beyond the low island some half mile away. The heron had long ago taken himself off, so there was nothing to be done but pole across the mud in pursuit of the duck. I hadn't gone many yards when I found that I was going much faster than I expected, and soon saw the cause. The tide was falling, and I was being carried along with it. This would bring me nearer to my ducks, and I lazily guided the punt with the stake. On rounding the island, I found a new source of interest. The mere opened up to a much larger extent, and away towards my right I could see a break in the low land as if a wide ditch had been cut through while in this opening, ever and anon, dark objects rose up and disappeared again in a way I couldn't account for. The water seemed to be running off the mud flats, and I saw that if I didn't wish to be left high but not dry on the long, slimy wastes, I must be careful to keep in the little channels or lakes which acted as natural drains to the acres of greasy mud. A conspicuous object attracted my attention some mile or more towards the opening in the land, it was a vessel lying high up on the mud and looking as if she was abandoned. The ducks had pitched a hundred yards or so beyond the island, and I approached as cautiously as I could, but just as I was putting down the stake to take up my gun, there was a swift sound of beating wings and splashing water, and away my birds flew low over the mud towards the old hulk. Here was a chance, I thought, if I could get on board and remain hidden, I might, by patiently waiting, get a shot, I looked at my watch. There was still plenty of daylight left, and the tide was only just beginning to leave the mud. I punted away, therefore, with renewed hope, and was not long in getting up to the old ship. There was just sufficient water over the mud to allow me to approach within ten or twelve feet, 
but further I could not push the punt. This was disappointing. However, I noticed the deep lake ran round the other side and determined to try my luck there. So, with a slosh and a heave, I got the flat afloat again and made for the deeper water. It turned out quite successful, and I was enabled to get right under the square overhanging counter, while a little lane of water led alongside her starboard quarter. I pushed the nose of the punt into this and was not long in clambering on board by the rusty irons of her forechains. The old vessel lay nearly upright in the soft mud, and a glance soon told she would never be used again. Her gear and rigging were all rotten, and everything valuable had been removed. She was a brig of some two hundred tons, and had been a fine vessel, no doubt. To me, there's always a world of romance in a deserted ship. The places she has been to, the scenes she has witnessed, the possibilities of crime, of adventure. All these thoughts crowd upon me when I see an old hulk lying deserted and forgotten, left to rot upon the mud of some lonely creek. In order to keep my punt afloat as long as possible, I towed her round and moored her under the stern, and then looked over the bulwarks for the duck. There they were, swimming not more than a hundred and fifty yards away, and they were coming towards me. I remained perfectly concealed under the high bulwark, and could see them paddling and feeding in the greasy weed. Their approach was slow, but I could afford to wait. Nearer and nearer they came, another minute, and they would be well within shot. I was already congratulating myself upon the success of my adventure, and thinking of the joy of Jones at this large accession to his larder, when suddenly there was a heavy splash, and a wild spluttering rush. The whole pack rose out of the water and went skimming over the mud toward the distant sea. I let off both barrels after them and tried to console myself by thinking I saw the feathers fly from one, but not a bird dropped, and I was left alone in my chagrin. What could have caused the splash, the luckless splash, I wondered? There was surely no one else aboard the ship, and certainly no one could get out here without mud patterns or a boat. I looked round. All was perfectly still. Nothing broke the monotony of the grey scene, sodden and damp and lifeless. A chill breeze came up from the southwest, bringing with it a raw mist, which was blotting out the dark distance and fast limiting my horizon. The day was drawing in, and I must be thinking of going home. As I turned round, my attention was arrested by seeing a duck punt glide past me in the now rapidly falling water, which was swirling by the mud bank on which the vessel lay. But there was no one in her. A dreadful thought struck me. It must be my boat, and how shall I get home? I ran to the stern and looked over. The duck punt was gone. The frayed and stranded end of the painter told me how it had happened. I had not allowed for the fall of the tide, and the strain of the punt as the water fell away had snapped the line, old and rotten as it was. I hurried to the bows, and jumping onto the bit saw my punt peacefully drifting away some quarter of a mile off. It was perfectly evident I could not hope to get to her again. It was beginning to rain steadily. I could see that I was in for a dirty weather, and became a little anxious about how I was to get back, especially as it was now rapidly growing dark. So thick was it that I couldn't see the low land anywhere, and could only judge of its position by remembering that the stern of the vessel pointed that way. The conviction grew upon me that I could not possibly get away from this doleful old hulk without assistance, and how to get it I could not for the life of me see. I hadn't seen a sign of a human being the whole day. It was not likely any more would be about at night. However, I shouted as loud as I could, and then waited to hear if there were any response. There was not a sound. Only the wind moaned slightly through the stumps of the masts, and something creaked in the cabin. Well, I thought, at least it might be worse. I shall have shelter for the night, while, if I had been left on one of the islands, I should have had to spend the night exposed to the pelting rain. Happy thought. Go below before it gets too dark, and see what sort of a berth can be got, if the worst comes to the worst. So thinking, I went to the booby hatch, and found, as I expected, that it was half broken open, and anyone could go below who liked. As I stepped down the rotting companion, the air smelt foul and dank. I went below very cautiously, for I was not at all sure that the boards would bear me. It was fortunate I did so, for as I stepped off the lowest step, the floor gave way under my foot, 
and had I not been holding onto the stair rail, I should have fallen through. Before going any further, I took a look around. The prospect was not inviting. The light was dim. I could scarcely make out objects near me. All else was obscurity. I could see that the whole of the inside of the vessel was completely gutted. What little light there was came through the stern ports. A small round speck of light looked at me out of the darkness ahead, and I could see that the flooring had either all given way or had been taken out of her. At my feet a gleam of water showed me what to expect if I should slip through the floor joists. Altogether a more desolate, gloomy, ghostly place it would be difficult to find. I could not see any bunk or locker where I could sit down, and everything movable had been taken out of the hulk. Groping my way with increasing caution, I stepped across the joists and felt along the side of the cabin. I soon came to a bulkhead. Continuing to grope, I came to an opening. If the cabin was dim, here was blackness itself. I felt it would be useless to attempt to go further, especially as a very damp, foul odour came up from the bilge water in her hold. As I stood looking into the darkness, a creepy, chilly shudder passed over me, and with a shiver, I turned round to look at the cabin. My eyes had now become used to the gloom. A deeper patch of darkness on my right suggested the possibility of a berth, and groping my way over to it, I found that the lower bulk was still entire. Here at least I could rest, if I found it impossible to get to shore. Having some wax vestas in my pocket, I struck a light and examined the bunk. It was better than I expected. If I could only find something to burn, I should be comparatively cheerful. Before reconciling myself to my uncomfortable position, I resolved to see whether I could not get to the shore, and went up the rickety stairs again. It was raining hard and the wind had caught up. Nothing could be more dismal. I looked over the side and lowered myself down from the main chains to see if it were possible to walk over the mud. I found I couldn't reach the mud at all, and fearful of being unable to climb back if I let go, I clambered up the side again and got on board. It was quite clear I must pass the night here. Before going below, I once more shouted at the top of my voice more to keep up my own spirits than with any hope of being heard, and then paused to listen. Not a sound of any sort replied. I now prepared to make myself as comfortable as I could. It was a dreary prospect. I would rather have spent the night on deck than down below in that foul cabin, but the drenching, driving rain as well as the cold drove me to seek shelter below. It seemed so absurd to be in the position of a shipwrecked sailor within two or three miles of a prosy country hamlet and in a landlocked harbour while actually on land, if the slimy deep mud could be called land. I had not many matches left, but I had my gun and cartridges. The idea occurred to me to fire off minute guns, that's what I ought to do, of course. The red flash will be seen in this dark night, for it was dark now and no mistake. Getting up onto the highest part of the vessel, I blazed away. The noise sounded to me deafening. Surely the whole countryside would be aroused. After firing off a dozen cartridges, I waited. But the silence only seemed the more oppressive and the blackness all the darker. It's no good. I'll turn in, I thought dejectedly. With great difficulty, I groped my way to the top of the companion ladder and bumped dismally down the steps. If only I had a light, I should be fairly comfortable, I thought. Happy thought, make a spit devil, as we used to when boys coil a little cone of damp gunpowder. I got out my last two cartridges and emptying the powder carefully into my hand, I moistened it and worked it up into a paste. I then placed it on the smooth end of the rail and lighted it. This was brilliant at least so it seemed by contrast with the absolute darkness around me. By its light I was able to find my way to the bunk, and it lasted just long enough for me to arrange myself fairly comfortably for the night. By contriving a succession of matches, I was enabled to have enough light to see to eat my frugal supper, for I had kept a little sherry and a few sandwiches to meet emergencies, and it was a fortunate thing I had. The light and the food made me feel more cheery, and by the time the last match had gone out, I felt worse might have happened to me by a long way. As I lay still, waiting for sleep to come, the absurdity of the situation forced itself upon me. Here was I, to all intents and purposes, as much cut off from all communication with the rest of the world 
as if I were cast away upon a desert island. The chances were that I should make someone see or hear me the next day. Jones would be certain to have the country searched, and at the longest I should only endure the discomfort of one night and get well laughed at for my pains. But meanwhile, I was absolutely severed from all human contact and was as isolated as Robinson Crusoe, only more so, for I had no other living thing whatever to share my solitude. The silence of the place was perfect, and if silence can woo sleep, sleep ought very soon to have come. But when one is hungry and wet, and in a strange, uncanny kind of place, besides being in one's clothes, it is a very difficult thing to go to sleep. First my head was too low, then, after resting it on my arms, I got cramp in them. My back seemed all over bumps when I turned on my side. I appeared to have got rather serious enlargement of the hip joint, and I found my damp clothes smelled very musty. After sighing and groaning for some time, I sat up for a change of position and nearly fractured my skull in so doing against the remains of what had once been a berth above me. I didn't dare to move in the inky blackness, for I had seen sufficient to know that I might easily break my leg or neck in the flawless cabin. There was nothing for it but to sit still or lie down and wait for daylight. I had no means of telling the time. When I had last looked at my watch before the last match had gone out, it was not more than six o'clock. It might now be about eight, or perhaps not so late. Fancy twelve long hours spent in that doleful black place with nothing in the world to do to pass away the time. I must go to sleep, and so, full of this resolve, I lay down again. I suppose I went to sleep. All I can recollect after lying down is keeping my mind resolutely turned inwards, as it were, and fixed upon the arduous business of counting an imaginary and interminable flock of sheep pass one by one through an ideal gate. This meritorious method of compelling sleep had, no doubt, been rewarded, but I have no means of knowing how long I slept, and I cannot tell at what hour of the night the following strange circumstances occurred, for occur they certainly did. And I am as perfectly convinced that I was the oral witness to some ghastly crime, as I am that I am writing these lines. I have little doubt I should be laughed at, as Jones laughed at me, to be told that I was dreaming, that I was overtired and nervous. In fact, so accustomed have I become to this sort of thing, that I now hardly ever tell my tale, or, if I do, I put it in the third person, and then I find people believe it, or at least take much more interest in it. I suppose the reason is that people cannot bring themselves to think so strange a thing could have happened to such a prosy, everyday sort of man as myself, and they cannot divest their minds of the idea that I am, well, to put it mildly, drawing on my imagination for facts. Perhaps, if the tale appears in print, it will be believed, as a facetious friend of mine once said to a newly married couple who had just seen the announcement of their marriage in the Times. Ah, didn't know you were married till you saw it in print. Well, be the time what it may have been. All I know is that the next thing I can remember after getting my fifth hunter's sheep through the gate is that I heard two most horrible yells ring through the darkness. I sat bolt upright, and as a proof that my senses were all there, I didn't bring my head this time against the berth overhead, remembering to bend it outward so as to clear it. There was not another sound. The silence was as absolute as a darkness. I must have been dreaming, I thought, but the sounds were ringing in my ears and my heart was beating with excitement. There must have been some reason for this. I never was taken this way before. I couldn't make it out and felt very uncomfortable. I sat there listening for some time, no other sound breaking the deathly stillness, and becoming tired of sitting, I lay down again. Once more I set myself to get my interminable flocks through that gate but I couldn't help myself listening. There seemed to me a sound growing in the darkness, something gathering in the particles of the air as if molecules of the atmosphere were rustling together and with still movement were whispering something. The wind had died down, and I would have gone on deck if I could move, but it was hazardous enough moving about in the light. It would have been madness to attempt to move in that blackness, and so I lay still and tried to sleep. But now there was a sound, indistinct but no mere fancy, a muffled sound, as of some movement in the forepart of the ship. I listened intently and gazed into the darkness. What was the sound? 
It didn't seem like rats. It was a dull, shuffling kind of noise, very indistinct and conveying no clue whatever as to its cause. It lasted only for a short time, but now the cold, damp air seemed to have become more piercingly chilly. The raw iciness seemed to strike into the very marrow of my bones and my teeth chattered. At the same time, a new sense seemed to be assailed. The foul odour, which I had noticed arising from the stagnant water in the bilge, appeared to rise into more objectionable prominence, as if it had been stirred. I can't stand this, I muttered, shivering in horrible aversion at the disgusting odour. I'll go on deck at all hazards. Rising to put this resolve into execution, I was arrested by the noise beginning again. I listened. This time, I distinctly distinguished two separate sounds. One, like a heavy soft weight being dragged along with difficulty. The other, like the hard sound of boots on boards. Could there be others on board after all? If so, why had they made no sound when I clambered on deck or afterwards when I shouted and fired my gun? Clearly, if there were people, they wished to remain concealed, and my presence was inconvenient to them. But how absolutely still and quiet they had kept. It appeared incredible that there should be anyone. I listened intently. The sound had ceased again, and once more the most absolute stillness reigned around. A gentle swishing, wobbling, lapping noise seemed to form itself in the darkness. It increased until I recognised the chattering and bubbling of water. It must be the tide rising, I thought. It's reached the rudder and is eddying around the stern post. This also accounted in my mind for the other noises because, as the tide surrounded the vessel and she thus became waterborne, all kinds of sounds might be produced in the old hulk as she resumed her upright position. However, I couldn't get rid of the chilly, horrid feeling those two screams had produced, combined with the disgusting smell which was getting more and more obtrusive it was foul, horrible, revolting, like some carrion, putrid and noxious. I prepared to take my chances of damage and rose up to grope my way to the companion ladder. It was a more difficult job than I had any idea of. I had my gun, it was true, and with it I could feel for the joists, but once I let go of the edge of the bunk, I had nothing to steady me and nearly went headlong at the first step. Fortunately, I reached back in time to prevent my fall, but this attempt convinced me that I had better endure the strange horrors of the unknown than the certain miseries of a broken leg or neck. I sat down, therefore, on the bunk. Now that my own movements had ceased, I became aware that the shuffling noise was going on all the time. Well, thought I, they may shuffle, they won't hurt me, and I shall go to sleep again. So reflecting, I lay down, holding my gun, ready to use it as a club, if necessary. Now, it's all very well to laugh at superstitious terrors. Nothing is easier than to obtain a cheap reputation for brilliancy, independence of thought and courage, by deriding the fear of the supernatural when comfortably seated in a drawing room, well lighted and with company. But put those scoffers in a like situation with mine, and I don't believe they would have been any more free from a feeling the reverse of bold, mocking and comfortable than I was. I had read that most powerful ghost story, The Haunted and the Haunters, by the late Lord Lytton, and the vividness of that weird tale had always impressed me greatly. Was I actually now to experience in my own person, and with no possibility of escape, the trying ordeal that bold ghost hunter went through under much more favourable circumstances? He at least had his servant with him. He had fuel and a light, and above all, he could get away when he wanted to. I felt I could face any number of spiritual manifestations if only I had warmth and light. But the icy coldness of the air was eating into my bones, and I shivered until my teeth chattered. I couldn't get to sleep. I couldn't prevent myself listening. And at last I gave up the contest and let myself listen. But there seemed now nothing to listen to. All the time I had been refusing to let my ears do their office by putting my handkerchief over one ear and lying on my arm with the other. A confused noise appeared to reach me, but the moment I turned round and lay on my back, everything seemed quiet. It's only my fancy after all, the result of cold and want of a good dinner. I'll go to sleep. But in spite of this, I lay still, listening a little longer. There was a sound of trickling water against the broad bilge of the old hulk, and I knew the tide was rising fast. My thoughts turned to the lost canoe, 
into reproaching myself with my stupidity in not allowing enough rope or looking at it more carefully. Suddenly, I became all attention again. An entirely different sound now arrested me. It was distinctly a low groan, then followed almost immediately by heavy blows, blows which fell upon a soft substance, and then more groans, and again those sickening blows. There must be men here. Where are they, and what is it? I sat up and strained my eyes towards where the sound came from. The sounds had ceased again. Should I call out and let the man or men know that I was here? What puzzled me was the absolute darkness. How could anyone see to hit an object or do anything else in this dense obscurity? It appalled me. Anything might pass an inch's distance, and I couldn't tell who or what it was. But how could anything human find its way about any more than I could? Perhaps there was a solid bulkhead dividing the forecastle from me, but it would have to be very sound and with no chink whatever to prevent a gleam or ray of light finding its way out somewhere. I couldn't help feeling convinced that the whole hull was open from one end to the other. Was I really dreaming after all? To convince myself that I was wide awake, I felt in my pockets for my notebook, and pulling out my pencil, I opened the book and, holding it in my left hand, wrote as well as I could, by feel alone, I am wide awake. It is about midnight, Christmas Eve, 1877. I found I had got to the bottom of the page, so I shut the book up, resolving to look at it the next morning. I felt curious to see what the writing looked like by daylight but all further speculation was cut short by the shuffling and dragging noise beginning again. There was no doubt the sounds were louder and were coming my way. I never in all my life felt so uncomfortable. I may as well at once confess it, so frightened. There, in that empty hull over that boardless floor, over those rotting joists, somebody or something was dragging some heavy weight. What I could not imagine, only the shrieks, the blows, the groans, the dull thumping sounds compelled me to suspect the worst, to feel convinced that I was actually within some few feet of a horrible murder then being committed. That I actually heard the sounds, I had no doubt. That they were growing louder and more distinct, I felt painfully aware. The horror of the situation was intense. If only I could strike a light and see what was passing close there, but I had no matches. I could hear a sound as of someone breathing slowly, stertorously, and a dull groan. And once more the cruel sodden blows fell again, followed by a drip, drip, and heavy drop in the dank water below, from which the sickening smell rose, pungent, reeking, horrible. The dragging, shuffling noise now began again. It came quite close to me, so close that I felt I had only to put out my hand to touch it, the thing. Good heavens, was it coming to my bunk? The thing passed, and all the time the dull drip, as if some heavy drops fell into the water below. It was awful. All this time I was sitting up and holding my gun by its barrel, ready to use it if I were attacked. As the sound passed me at the closest, I put out the gun involuntarily, but it touched nothing, and I shuddered at the thought that there was no floor over which the weight could be drawn. I must be dreaming some terribly vivid dream. It couldn't be real. I pinched myself. I felt I was pinching myself. It was no dream. The sweat poured off my brow, my teeth chattered with the cold. It was terrific in its dreadful mystery. And now the sounds altered. The noises had reached the companion ladder. Something was climbing them with difficulty. The old stairs creaked, bump, thump. The thing was dragged up the steps with many pauses, and at last it seemed to have reached the deck. A long pause now followed. The silence grew dense around. I dreaded the stillness, the silence, that made itself be heard almost more than the sounds. What new horror would that awful quiet bring forth? What terror was still brooding in the depths of that clinging darkness, darkness that could be felt? The absolute silence was broken, horribly broken, by a dull drip from the stairs, and then the dragging began again, distant and less distinct, but the steps were louder. They came nearer over my head. The old boards creaked, and the weight was dragged right over me. I could hear it above my head, for the steps stopped, and two distinct raps, followed by a third heavier one, sounded so clearly above me that it seemed almost as if it was something striking the rotten woodwork of the berth over my head. The sounds were horribly suggestive of the elbows and head 
of a body being dropped on the deck. And now, as if the horrors had not been enough, a fresh ghastliness was added. So close were the wraps above me that I involuntarily moved, as if I had been struck by what caused them. As I did so, I felt something drop onto my head and slowly trickle over my forehead. It was too horrible. I sprang up in my disgust, and with a wild cry I stepped forward and instantly fell between the joists into the rank water below. The shock was acute. Had I been asleep and dreaming before, this must inevitably have roused me up. I found myself completely immersed in water, and for a moment was absolutely incapable of thinking. As it was pitch dark and my head had gone under, I couldn't tell whether I was above water or not. As I felt the bottom and struggled and splashed onto my legs, it was only by degrees I knew I must be standing with my head out of the foul mixture because I was able to breathe easily, although the wet running down from my hair dribbled into my mouth as I stood, shivering and gasping. It was astonishing how a physical discomfort overcame a mental terror. Nothing could be more miserable than my present position, and my efforts were at once directed to getting out of this dreadful place. But let anyone who has ever had the ill luck to fall out of bed in his boyhood try and recollect his sensations, the bewildering realisation that he is not in bed, that he does not know where he is, which way to go, or what to do to get back again. Everything he touches seems strange, and one piece of furniture much the same as any other. How well remembered such an accident, and how, having rolled under the bed before I was wide awake, I couldn't for the life of me understand why I couldn't get up, what it was that kept me down. I had not the least idea which way to get out and kept going round and round in a circle under my bed for a long time and should probably have been doing it until daylight had not my sighs and groans awoken my brother who slept in the same room and who came to my help. If then one is so utterly at fault in the room every inch of which one knows intimately, how much more hopeless was my position at the bottom of this old vessel half immersed in water and totally without any clue which would help me get out. I had not the least idea which was the ship's stern or which her stem, and every moment I made with my feet only served to unsteady me, as the bottom was all covered with slime and uneven with the great timbers of the vessel. My first thought on recovering my wits was to stretch my arms up over my head, and I was relieved to find I could easily reach the joists above me. I was always fairly good at gymnastics, and had not much difficulty in drawing myself up and sitting on the joist, although the weight of my wet clothes added to my exertions considerably. Having so far succeeded, I sat and drained, as it were, into the water below. The smell was abominable. I never disliked myself so much, and I shivered with cold. As I could not get any wetter, I determined to go on deck somehow, but where was the companion ladder? I had nothing to guide me. Strange to say, the reality of my struggles had almost made me forget the mysterious phenomena I had been listening to. But now, as I looked round, my attention was caught by a luminous patch which quivered and flickered on my right. At what distance from me, I couldn't tell. It was like the light from a glowworm, only larger and changing in shape, sometimes elongated like a lambent oval, and then it would sway one way or another, as if caught in a draught of air. When I was looking at it and wondering what could cause it, I heard the steps above my head. They passed over me and then seemed to grow louder on my left. A creeping dread again came over me. If only I could get out of this horrible place, but where were the stairs? I listened. The footfall seemed to be coming down some steps. Then the companion ladder must be on my left, but if I moved that way I should meet the thing, whatever it was, that was coming down. I shuddered at the thought. However, I made up my mind. Stretching up my hand very carefully, I felt for the next joist, reached it and crawled across. I stopped to listen. The steps were coming nearer. My hearing had now become acute. I could almost tell the exact place of each footfall. It came closer, closer, quite close, surely, on the very joist on which I was sitting. I thought I could feel the joist quiver and involuntarily move my hand to prevent the heavy tread falling on it. The steps passed on, grew fainter, and ceased as they drew near the pale lambent light. One thing I noticed with curious horror, and that was that although the thing must have passed between me and the light, yet it was never for a moment obscured, which it must have been had any body or substance passed between, and yet I was certain that the steps went directly from me to it. 
It was all horribly mysterious. And what had become of the other sound, the thing that was being dragged? An irresistible shudder passed over me, but I determined to pursue my way until I came to something. It would never do to sit still and shiver there. After many narrow escapes of falling again, I reached a bulkhead, and cautiously feeling along it, I came to an opening. It was the companion ladder. By this time, my hands, by feeling over the joists, had become dry again. I felt along the step to be quite sure that it was the stairs, and in doing so, I touched something wet, sticky, clammy. Oh, horrible, was it? A cold shiver shook me nearly off the joist, and I felt an unutterable sense of repulsion to going on. However, the fresher air which came down the companion revived me, and conquering my dread, I clambered onto the step. It didn't take long to get upstairs and stand on the deck again. I think I have never in all my life experienced such a sense of joy as I did on being out of that disgusting hole. It was true I was soaking wet, and the night wind cut through me like a knife, but these were things I could understand, and were a matter of common experience. What I had gone through might only be a question of nerves and had no tangible or visible terror, but it was nonetheless very dreadful, and I would not go through such an experience again for words. As I stood cowering under the lee of the bulwark, I looked round at the sky. There was a pale light, as if of daybreak, away in the east, and it seemed as if all my troubles would be over with the dawn. It was bitterly cold. The wind had got round to the north, and I could faintly make out the low shore astern. While I stood shivering there, a cry came down the wind. At first I thought it was a seabird, but it sounded again. I felt sure it was a human voice. I sprang up on the taffrail and shouted at the top of my lungs, then paused. The cry came down clearer and distinct. It was Jones's voice. Had he heard me? I waved my draggled pocket handkerchief and shouted again. In the silence which followed, I caught the words, We're coming! What joyful words! Never did shipwrecked mariner on a lonely isle feel greater delight. My misery would soon be over. Anyhow, I should not have to wait long. Unfortunately, the tide was low and still falling. Nothing but a boat could reach me, I thought, and to get a boat would take some time. I therefore stamped up and down on the deck to get warm, but I had an instinctive aversion for the companion ladder and the deep shadows of the forepart of the vessel. As I turned around in my walk, I thought I saw something moving over the mud. I stopped. It was undoubtedly a figure coming towards me. A voice hailed me in gruff accents. Billy Oi! Be anyone aboard? Was anyone aboard? What an absurd question. Here had I been shouting myself hoarse. However, I quickly reassured him, and then understand why my rescuer did not sink in the soft mud. He had mud patterns on. Coming up as close as he could, he shouted to me to keep clear, and then threw first one, then the other, clattering wooden board onto the deck. I found them, and under the instructions of my friend, I didn't take long in putting them on. The man was giving me directions as how to manage, but I didn't care how much wetter I got, and dropped over the side into the slime. Sliding and straddling, I managed to get to my friend, and then together we skated, as it were, to the shore, although skating very little represents the awkward splashes and slips I made on my way to land. I found quite a little crowd awaiting me on the bank, but Jones, with ready consideration, hurried me off to a cart he had in a lane near, and drove me home. I told him the chief points of the adventure on our way, but didn't say anything of the curious noises. It's odd how shy a man feels at telling what he knows people will never believe. It was not until the evening of the next day that I began to tell him, and then only after I was fortified by an excellent dinner and some very good claret. Jones listened attentively. He was far too kindly and well-bred to laugh at me, but I could see he didn't believe one word as to the reality of the occurrence. Very strange. How remarkable. Quite extraordinary, he kept saying, with evident interest. But I was sure he put it all down to my fatigue and disordered imagination, and so to do him justice as everybody else to whom I've told the tale since. The fact is, we cannot in this prosaic age believe in anything the least approaching the supernatural, nor do I. But nevertheless, I am as certain as I am that I am writing these words that the thing did really happen and will happen again. May happen every night for all I know, only I don't intend to try and put my belief to the test. I have a theory which of course will be laughed at, 
And as I'm not in the least scientific, I cannot bolster it up by scientific arguments, it is this. As Mr. Edison has now discovered, by certain simple processes, human sounds can be reproduced at any future date, so accidentally, and owing to the combination of most curious coincidences, it might happen that the agonized cries of some suffering being, or the sounds made by one at a time when all other emotions are as nothing compared to the supreme sensations of one committing some awful crime, could be impressed on the atmosphere or surface of an enclosed building, which could be reproduced by a current of air passing into that building under the same atmospheric conditions. This is the vague explanation I have given myself. However, be the explanation what it may be, the facts are as I have stated them. Let those laugh who did not experience them. To return to the end of the story, there were two things I pointed out to Jones as conclusive that I wasn't dreaming. One was my pocketbook. I showed it to him, and the words were quite clear, only of course very straggling. This is a facsimile of the writing, but I cannot account for the date being 1837. I am wide awake. It is Christmas Eve, 1837. The other point was the horrible stains on my hands and clothes. A foul-smelling dark chocolate stain was on my hair, hands and clothes. Jones said, of course, this was from the rust of the mouldering ironwork, some of which had no doubt trickled down owing to the heavy rain through the defective caulking of the deck. The fact is, there is nothing that an ingenious mind can't explain. But the question is, is the explanation the right one? I could easily account for the phosphorescent light. The water was foul and stagnant, and it was no doubt caused by the same gases which produced the well-known ignis fatus, or will-of-the-wisp. We visited the ship, and I recovered my gun. There were the same stains on deck as there were on my clothes, and, curiously enough, they went in a nearly straight line over the place where I lay, from the top of the companion to the starboard bulwark. We carefully examined the forepart of the ship. It was as completely gutted as the rest of her. Jones was glad to get on deck again as the atmosphere was very unpleasant, and I had no wish to stay. At my request, Jones made every inquiry he could about the old hulk. Not much was elicited. So far it looked as if it were credited with being haunted. The owner, who had been the captain of her, had died about three years before. His character did not seem amiable, but as he had left his money to the most influential farmer in the district, the country people were unwilling to talk against him. I went with Jones to call on the farmer and asked him point-blank if he had ever heard whether a murder had been committed on board the Lily. He stared at me and he laughed. Not as I know of, was all his answer, and I never got any nearer than that. I feel that this is all very unsatisfactory. I wish I could give some thrilling and sensational explanation. I'm sorry I cannot. My imagination suggests many, as no doubt it will to each of my readers who possesses that faculty, but I have only written this to tell the actual facts, not to add to our superabundant fiction. If I ever come across any details bearing upon the subject, I will not fail to communicate them at once. The vessel I found was the Lily of Ghoul, owned by one master Gad Earwaker and built in 1801. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies, don't they? So that was the um, Christmas story, Christmas Eve on an Abandoned Hulk by Frank Cowper. Um, it's late now, and you can probably tell because I'm going to be talking more rubbish than normal. I was wanting to finish this and get it posted up so it could be scheduled because I'm really busy between now and Christmas. I'm trying to use every every spare minute to pack a story in. Um, this is a, I enjoy this story. I enjoy most of them. Um, something about Frank Cowper. Frank Cowper was mainly a yachtsman, and you can tell that in his knowledge of boats, really, that comes across in this story. He was most famous for his book called Sailing Tours, and he was credited with being the man who developed the whole idea of modern leisure yachting and sailing around. Um, he died in 1930, was born in 1849, and his son was a famous painter, Frank Cadogan P Cowper. The Cowper family, I wonder if he's um, connected to the other Cowper families, uh, the ones who wrote uh, Glastonbury Romance. I'll have to look into that. Um, 
I think he was a, a pretty good writer. He's got a quite a realistic style, a very business-like style, and the whole business of him going duck hunting rings very true. You can imagine that this was something he was very familiar with. I myself have had some time in the coastal marshes of the UK. You may ask what I was doing there. I'm not going to tell you. No, I was just wandering around, getting stuck in the mud, really. But, um, you know, so the description that he gives of those big, muddy, greasy mudness that stretches forever, full of ducks and things, that is very uh, familiar to me, and it rings very true. Um, he also is very good at describing the horrible dreariness of the Hulk, that you can feel the damp and cold of it seeping into your bones. And uh, that is very convincing. One of the things I would say about the story is this. We did the kit bag by Algernon Blackwood. And all, that has a very similar monster off stage, which is, of course, a classic thing of ghost and horror stories. We hear this, this incident going on. And it doesn't touch him. He's an observer, very much like uh, Johnson in the kit bag. And, um, but yet it manages to be, because, because he builds up the sensory impact, we've already got the cold, we get the noise, we get the, um, the sound, we get the thing dripping on him. So he's touching all our senses and he manages to bring this horrible situation. And it is a horrible situation. You can imagine yourself how awful it would be to be stuck on this dreary boat. It's a Christmas Eve story, but you actually wouldn't know it was Christmas Eve unless he told you. Um, unlike many typically Christmas stories, such as ones I've written myself, um, there are none of the tropes of Christmas. There aren't the snowmen and the reindeers and the evil Santa Claus with his machine gun, uh, as that, uh, the Lee Majors film. Um, what was that in? That was in Scrooge, I think. That I, one of my favourite Christmas movies, to be honest. Um, and the, but in fact, this dreariness, this cold, miserable, wet dampness, is actually what we get in England um, at Christmas. Rarely do we get that lovely snow stuff. You have to go to Germany or somewhere for that. Um, although the weather here has been pretty cold and crispy, it's been very pleasant. Very very minus seven degrees centigrade and very icy and crispy and bright. So it's, well, yesterday rained today. But um, yeah, it was pretty good. Anyway, I drone on. So yeah, so I'm going to try and upload some of these things. So we've got them ready because I've got a load of things to do. I'm going to Whitby quite soon to the Winter Ghosts Festival run by the Folk Horror Revival people. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and actually, in the meantime, I'm going to Amsterdam, would you believe? We're sailing, so there's a nautical theme. We're sailing from Newcastle upon Tyne over to Amsterdam. We don't spend a lot of time there, but I think it'd be really pretty to see the city in all its glory. And uh, no, I'm not going to any drug shops and I'm not going to the red light district. I will spend my time in culture. Mostly, anyway. So, okay, there you go. That's that. Um, got a, we've got a website. I'm trying to build this website up. Um, I'm trying to kind of build the podcast, really. So it's a simple thing to remember. It's www.classicghoststories.com. That's it. Check it out. There's all sorts of opportunities. You can see we've got a mug. Would you believe that? A T-shirt. I'm trying to monetize. That I love all the, you know, that, that tendency to make new verbs. I love them. Weaponize, monetize. I heard another one the other day, I can't remember what it was now, but I thought, wow, that's a good, that's a good one. Um, the American language is very creative, and I like to steal bits of it, um, because it is very vibrant and very alive. Anyway, that's that. Next week, there'll be more, more Christmas stuff. I've got a few more. I want to do an E.F. Benson story called Between the Lights. I haven't recorded that. I've got another Russell Kirk story called Save Your Gate, which I have recorded but not edited. And I may slip in one of my own, um, although you couldn't really claim it was a classic ghost story, although in form it's classic, um, if not in fame. Anyway, there we are. Night, night. I'm talking rubbish. I'm tired. You get yourself some sleep because sleep is very important. Also, food. So get all of those things and exercise, obviously. 
but you know, take care. Night-night.